This week, you may have heard the words, I fell short. And Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, said, I fell short. See, he apologised for breaking the law, a law that he himself had introduced. And he received a fixed penalty notice. We don't know how much. What happens when the lawmakers become the lawbreakers? There are two things that I saw in, um, in the news, but also in social media and in conversations um, going door to door. There were one or two conversations about um, how well, our politicians, they're, they're lawbreakers and things. What happens when the lawmakers become lawbreakers? Well, two things that I observed. First of all, there's a cry out for justice to be done. What do you think should happen to Boris and the other MPs who broke the law? When you couldn't party or see a loved one in a hospital, what do you think should happen to them? There's a cry for justice, and, and people around the UK have been crying out for, oh, it just isn't fair, it isn't right. They should face everything that's coming to them, and not just a £10 fine or whatever. It should be means-tested. The fine should be means-tested. There's a cry for justice to be done, especially because of the role he holds. The other thing that I observed was people were saying, and, and yes, some of the people that were saying this were um, Tory MPs or Tories themselves. He's just human. He's just human, and humans fall short. Two things, justice should be done and humans fall short. There's a passage in Romans chapter three, a verse that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So confession time. Someone left this note for me on my car. <laughs> How blessed I was. And then after a few moments, I thought, ooh, it's a sermon illustration. And then I thought, it is actually a blessing. I received a penalty charge notice for parking in the car park without paying. I forgot, I got into a conversation. And when I went back to the car, the traffic warden had left a, love, a lovely love note for me. <laughs> Warning, unauthorized removal or interference with this notice is an offense. I want you to realize that each of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We, we'll think about that a little bit more in a moment, but something needs to be done with this. I opened it up. And they use tiny writing. <coughs> and they say what I've done wrong and what I need to do to make it right. A payment slip. I paid online, so I didn't need to say the, send the payment slip in. I wonder if you have received one of these before. Sorry, it wasn't an open confession time. <laughs> Rhetorical question. As we journey through Good Friday... I want us to restory ourselves, as I said, restory ourselves with the gospel, the good news of Jesus. There's a wonderful book, it's by Pastor Ray Ortland's short book, which makes it wonderful, but it's, it's called The Gospel, How the Church Portrays the Beauty of Christ. And there's this quote, and I'll read it in its entirety, and, and hopefully, we will understand why it's important for us to hear the gospel again. I'm not going to say things, if you've been in church for, for, for quite a while or Christian for quite a while, I'm not going to say things today that you haven't heard before, probably. 
So probably you'll hear it again. But we need to hear things again and again. The quote on the screen says, believing the gospel is not easy. Hearing it can be, but believing it is not easy. It says that an all-holy God loves sinners like us. Not just the law makers becoming law breakers, but me and you. It says God sent his only son to die for us. It says that he pours out his Holy Spirit to give us life and keep us. It claims that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It even says that the Savior is God's strategy to transform the universe. Does this good news not seem improbable? We either proudly believe that we are too good to be judged, or we proudly believe that we're too bad to be saved. So the gospel is a continual surprise, and we need to hear it again and again. Allow yourself to be surprised by the good news of Jesus this morning. Oh, I've been a Christian for 30 years. Wonderful. Allow yourself to hear the good news of Jesus afresh this morning and be surprised by the good news. Be restored as we're restoried. And as we allow ourselves to be surprised by the good news once again, my prayer is that we will consider where we stand with the cross of Jesus. And you'll notice this morning, there is a cross by the lectern, and I'm stood behind it, which I will suggest is the place that we need to take in relation to the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. I'm just going to take parts of this passage and just share some thoughts on it. First of all, you were dead because of your sins. Before we consider the good news, we need to consider the bad news, the reality of the situation. And it's helpful for us to go back into the Old Testament. And as we look at in Isaiah chapter 6, we see a beautiful vision of the holy, perfect presence of God. And angels, angelic beings, seraphim, cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. Perfect, good, right, completely righteous in word, thought, and action. God is holy. I said when we had a leaders, uh, we had a clergy retreat, a church leaders retreat uh, last week. And I shared from this passage in Isaiah and, and said, what do we do when we want to emphasize something when we type things today? And people say, we bold, put it in bold. We, what other things could we do? Italics, so capital letters, underline it. So is someone from over there? We repeat it in a different color, capital letters, exclamation mark, yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the seraphim cried out. And they're repeating it for emphasis because God is completely other and perfect. And Isaiah is there before a vision of the holy presence of God. And his response is to cry out, woe is me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is our starting point. 
recognizing that in comparison to God, we are ruined without Jesus. In comparison to, to God's perfect holiness, we are just completely deserving of death. Romans 3.23, I've already said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I fell short, Boris's words. They need to become our words. I fell short, God. Isaiah 53, verse 6, we, every one of us, have strayed away like sheep. We who left God's paths to follow our own. And when questioned by Jesus at the Last Supper, those that were following him were told by Jesus, one of you will betray me. And each of the 12 say, surely not I. Why didn't they say, well, it's not going to be me, because I know that it's not going to be me. Why did they ask? Maybe because they realized that they could be a betrayer. We need to be real with ourselves that before a holy God, without Jesus, we are ruined because of our sin. Verse 13 of Colossians 2 says, we are dead in our sins, or we were dead. And as a result of our sin, we can't have a close relationship with God. We live in a broken world. We have brokenness in our lives. And ultimately, we will face judgment and death. Because as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin are death. There is a penalty to be paid. But verse 13 doesn't stop with death and sin. The good news is that God made us alive with Christ and he forgave all our sins Paul the Apostle writes in the past tense, you were dead because of your sins, but God showed the initiative. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ Jesus, to quote from Ephesians 2. If you are dead, what can you do? That isn't a rhetorical question this time. If you are dead, what can you do? People are thinking, there's a few people are mouthing things. You can't do anything. You're dead. In our sins, we cannot do anything to make us right before God. But God made us alive with Christ. God did something to change the situation. And as we reflect on the cross this Good Friday, we reflect on God showing initiative, God doing something that we could not do for ourselves. We needed rescue, we needed saving, we needed cleansing, we needed to become alive. And the wages of sin being death taken away from us and us being given, given a gift, not wages, a gift of life. I had an envelope through our door yesterday with the exact amount. And I don't know who that was, but the exact amount that was needed. The wages of sin need to be paid, but the gift of God is given through Christ Jesus and he gives us life and he forgives us our sins we are forgiven as we turn in repentance back to God we're treated by God just as if we had never sinned as we went out and, and picked up litter this morning the rubbish was hiding typically as I said I wonder what sin is hidden in your life that one that, that you really wouldn't want anyone to know about. Even that one is forgiven by God. If you turn and believe in Jesus, laying that rubbish and sin at the cross today, 
We are freed from the punishment of our sin and rebellion against God. We avoid that punishment, the penalty that we deserve. The passage continues in verse 14 saying how he did it. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. I'm not going to nail this to the cross. It's probably not going to stick now. There we go. Well, it's, it's there. I no longer hold that. It is distant from me. And the sin that you have done against God and the sins that you will do during the rest of your life against God, as we give them to Jesus, they are distanced from us. And what he does is, is the rules that are broken, not the rule, the rule book itself, but the rules that we break that are listed, uh, for example, inside that penalty uh, charge notice. Those rules that we've broken, that list is cancelled, is, is torn up as he took it on himself on the cross. The Bible tells us that Jesus was paying the price of the penalty of our sin. He went to the cross and died instead of me and you. The charge against me or against you now has Jesus' name against it. In Psalm 103, we read that as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our sins or transgressions from us. They're distanced from us. We were dead but made alive. We were forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. And where does that leave us? In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them by publicly... Um, so he shamed them publicly by his victory over them uh, on the cross. Verse 15, um, Paul teaches that the spiritual rulers and authorities, Satan and his demons, were disarmed and shamed through Jesus' victory over the cross. That, this one verse could be a whole sermon in itself, but I'll spare you that one today. Rather than unpacking it in detail, I simply want to encourage us to be a people who stand behind the cross. So often we come to the cross and it's a helpful symbol to think about and to look at. But where do we position ourselves with it? Simon from Cyrene carried the cross of Jesus but followed behind the one who would be crucified. I want us to be people and believe it's right to be people who stand behind the cross. Let me explain. If I lift it up, what do I see if I look this way or that way? All I see is through the cross. So I look at the world through Jesus' sacrifice. I look at the world knowing and being reminded that I'm alive because of what he did. I'm forgiven. I am freed. I was dead, but now I am freed. So I look at the world in a new way because of what Jesus did on the cross. If I stand behind the cross, that is. If I stand before it, like this, You're thinking, well, no, that's behind it as well because it's both ways. But if I stand before it, I just look at the cross. If I stand behind it, the way that I'm facing, I can see through it and beyond it. When I stand behind the cross, Jesus' death and love for me is always going to be in the forefront of my mind. When I stand behind the cross, the declaration that James read from John chapter 19 saying it is finished is going to be on my lips. 
It's done. It's complete. I don't need to be good enough because the one who is good, good, good has been enough, enough, enough for me. When I stand behind the cross, I look at others with the grace of Jesus Christ, saying to myself, God has been gracious to me and therefore I can be gracious to them. And if it might be that they were dead and are now alive, it might be that I'm looking at someone who is still dead and needs to be made alive. There are times that we will be reminded by Satan or by people of the things that we have done against God or against others. And it may cause us to doubt. And if we're just here, they come straight to us. If we're here, behind the cross, when an arrow is thrown, or shot, sorry, or a criticism comes our way, or a doubting question comes, We are guarded by the cross on which Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and shamed them publicly. We are to be people who stand behind the cross. The cross on which Jesus made us alive and made it possible for us to be forgiven. When we stand behind the cross, we can become surprised daily by the grace of God. Surprised daily by Jesus' sacrifice. That he did everything he could to help me find my way back to the Father. And that changes the way that we live our lives. When we stand behind the cross, we're surprised by the love of God. We're embraced with the the outstretched arms as a shadow casting back on us, over us. Surprised by the power of God and his cross. Surprised by the forgiveness given and his passion displayed. We were dead But now we are made alive by Jesus. He forgave us our sins. Cancelled the charges against us and nailed them to the cross. There are times in our lives where we stand next to the cross. Or we stay at a distance from the cross. This morning... As we take communion in a moment, and Jackie will lead us through that bit of the service, we take it, and I I just want to ask you to say, Jesus, I want to stand behind your cross. So wherever I go, wherever I move forwards, I go with your cross before me, and I will follow you. Let me pray before Jackie comes up and leads us in communion. Father God, we thank you that you did what we could not do because we were dead and dead things can't do anything. Thank you that you didn't just make us pay for our sin, but you paid that price and you gave us the free gift of life and forgiveness. Thank you that the charge against us, the penalty against us is paid in full. And Jesus, we pray that we will position ourselves behind your cross today. Amen.